The first four words of Tongue Tied by Maxine Hong Kingston are long ago in China. And I think she starts the essay this way in order to emphasize the importance of the past, um, and in particular, a past as she imagines it, which is uh, the past of her ancestral homeland um, of China. And throughout this essay, we see a conflict between the traditional Chinese way of doing things and the American way of doing things, um, which is new to the narrator. Uh, so I'll continue reading in that first paragraph. Long ago in China, knot makers tied string into buttons and frogs and rope into bell pulls. There was one knot so complicated that it blinded the knot maker. And here we see a little bit of myth. Um, and I think the use of these Chinese myths is very important for Kingston uh, because she's bringing in not only what she has heard about her homeland, about her ancestral homeland, her family's homeland, she is from the United States, um, but she is also doing this in such an imaginative and sort of creative way. And the stories of what happened on an everyday level back in China are blended with these extraordinary, almost supernatural um, ideas. For example, this idea that tying the knot is going to blind the knot maker. Um, and I'll continue reading. Finally, an emperor outlawed this cruel knot, and the nobles could not order it anymore. If I had lived in China, I would have been an outlaw knot maker. Um, and here we see uh, Kingston's um, not only clinging to this sort of mythological past, uh, but also showing some type of, I would say, rebellious uh, nature um, and some type of empowerment against authority. And we see how that occurs uh, in her modern, current life here in the U.S., um, but even in her imagination. She's imagining what her life would have been like if she lived in ancient China, and she still sees herself as somebody who uh, provides some amount of conflict uh, against authority. Um, so I'm going to just skip ahead and read a little bit more. Um, so here's a quote from the first large paragraph at the bottom of the page. When I went to kindergarten and had to speak English for the first time, I became silent. A dumbness, a shame, still cracks my voice in two, even when I want to say hello casually or ask an easy question in front of the checkout counter or ask directions of a bus driver. And here we really see um, an inability to adapt <clears throat> to her modern American life. And it started at kindergarten, but it's no coincidence that it started with the use of the English language, which is not her home language, uh, which really is the dominant language uh, within the United States. It is the language of education. And we see that as she goes to school, she is unable to really um, express herself. Um, it's an interesting transition because we start with a little bit of myth, a little bit of fantasy, um, but it moves quickly into this um, idea of a lack of expression uh, and that our narrator is somehow voiceless and unable to, to make her, her, herself known. <clears throat> and I'm going to move ahead a little bit. Um, this is on the right hand side of the page. It was when I found out I had to talk that school became a misery, that the silence became a misery. I did not speak and felt bad each time that I did not speak. I read aloud in first grade though and heard the barest whisper with little squeaks come out of my throat. Louder, said the teacher, who scared the voice away again. The other Chinese girls did not talk either, so I knew the silence had to do with being a Chinese girl. And I really think that's an interesting um, concept, which is that not only did this individual find an inability to speak, not only was she voiceless, but she associates that with her particular ethnic background and with her gender. Um, and that within this, the context of this kindergarten, uh, excuse me, first grade class, uh, the people who are unable to express themselves are specifically Chinese girls, uh, which really means that this is a demographic that is unable to interact with an authority um, or some type of figure that represents an institution within the U.S. 
in this case a teacher. Um, and I skipped over the part where she talks about uh, the African-American uh, children um, and the connection that she had with them, although I would like to uh, point out that I believe that's a really interesting moment uh, because it shows some type of ability to relate uh, to others, um, not necessarily for the reasons you would hope for, uh, but because they both feel in some way that they are outside of the norm and that they are outside of, of the mainstream. Um, so I'll skip ahead a little bit uh, to the next paragraph. Reading out loud was easier than speaking because we did not have to make up what to say. But I stopped often, and the teacher would think I'd gone quiet again. I could not understand I. The Chinese I had seven strokes, intricacies. How could the American I, assuredly wearing a hat like the Chinese, have only three strokes, the middle so straight? Was it out of politeness that this writer left off the strokes, the way a Chinese has to write her own name small and crooked? No, it was not politeness. I is a capital, and U is lowercase. And so here we see that not only is it an issue of speaking up in a language that uh, the narrator is not comfortable with, right? Certainly anybody who shows up on the first day of kindergarten, and now she's moved on to first grade, uh, not speaking the language is going to have difficulty. But what she's talking about here is a difference in ideology. Uh, there's a different sort of cultural perspective about what it means to refer to oneself in the first person. Um, and that I in the Chinese language is intricate, and that the English representation of the word and the concept of I, the way I, I describe myself, is somehow lacking and, and simply foreign to her. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit more <clears throat> uh, to the long paragraph um, describing the difference between the American school and the Chinese school. After American school, we picked up our cigar boxes in which we had arranged books, brushes, and an ink box neatly and went to Chinese school from 5 to 7.30 p.m. There we chanted together, voices rising and falling, loud and soft, some boys shouting, everybody reading together, reciting together, reciting together and not alone with one voice. When we had a memorization test, the teacher let each of us come to his desk and say the lesson to him privately, while the rest of the class practiced copying or tracing. Most of the teachers were men. The boys who were so well behaved in the American school played tricks on them and talked back to them. The girls were not mute. They screamed and yelled during recess. When there were no rules, they had fist fights. And again, we see such a contrast between the Chinese way of doing things and the American way of doing things. Uh, and that within the American school system, uh, Chinese children, and in particular Chinese girls, feel so ostracized and so outside of what is considered normal uh, that they're unable to really express themselves. Um, however, in the Chinese school, which emphasizes community, rather than individualism, we see that the students are chanting together um, and that everybody is reciting with one voice. Uh, and that really shows the power, I think, of community and it shows a major difference in the way of approaching something like education for young children. Um, I also think it is significant here uh, that the young girls get into fistfights. Um, for one, because it breaks a gendered stereotype, uh, and that in the American school, the girls would not be expected to get into trouble. It's the boys who are the troublemakers. Um, but here we see that the girls get into fistfights uh, in part because they're, they feel like there is some amount of freedom uh, to express themselves and some level of comfort. <clears throat> 